Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Robert Daly. Robert is director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. And we're going to talk about what else, what the world is talking about, the uh, trade dispute between the United States and China. Welcome, Robert. Thanks Thank for you. Us. Not for the first time, probably not for the last. No, right? you know, speaking of that, I, I look back before we got together today right. uh, at the last time in this studio on this program that yeah. we discussed this topic. And we began looking at the language, whether trade war was the right terminology. Doesn't seem like there's any doubt about that now. Well, I think I surrendered to that last time, not being quite Somewhat ready to grudgingly. go for a martial metaphor. Yes. Uh, but if the, yeah, if the term is to be used at all, uh, then with this recent rate increase last Friday in t American tariffs on 200 billion in Chinese imports from 10 percent to 25 percent, Chinese retaliation on 60 billion, also from about 10, 15 percent varied up to about 25%. Yes, we would seem to be in the thick of it. So are, are we now in this tit for tat stage? Is that what we should expect? Well, it's a little soon to say. We don't yet know that this isn't brinksmanship and still negotiation theater. The new tariffs that we've put into effect are on goods that left Chinese ports last Friday. Those will take several weeks uh, to get here, and of course, ships can slow down. Uh, China's uh, then tit-for-tat uh, imposition of higher tariffs on 60 billion, that doesn't kick in until June 1st. So that gives time, but there is also no uh, negotiation planned over the month uh, of May that we know of. The next major point we're looking to is the G20 meeting when Xi Jinping and Donald Trump will be together at the G20. Are they definitely going to have a side meeting or is that just a It is not definite. Okay. It appears likely, but uh, it's actually quite a long ways away and it's a period of time in which both countries could feel more pain. So uh, both sides are engaged in a, a domestic uh, uh, support, building support for the, for their, right. you know, one newspaper characterized it as Chinese nationalism, but you know, the United States is doing the same thing when right. had a member of Congress talking about how soldiers suffer more than people will suffer in this, and so trying to ramp people up for the idea of sacrifice. Well, uh, how is this playing in China among the populace? Well, it's, it's changing, as you suggest. China, Beijing has been careful uh, so far, and this is now almost a year-long, well, over a year-long process, depending on where you count. Uh, they've been careful not to play it out in the Chinese press and not to try to stoke nationalist feeling and anti-Americanism because once that begins, once you legitimize protests in China, say, against the United States and the, the new imperialist hegemon trying to keep China down, if you legitimize protests, you can't control it. And it can immediately result, and ha this has happened in the past, in requests from these patriotic Chinese for Beijing to do more than it's prepared to do so far. So China's been very reluctant to release that. It is letting a little bit of that out since last Friday, most notably in a national broadcast that I think has been uh, retweeted. Become viral, yes. Yes. Uh, there was a, a Chinese news reader who issued a warning to the United States that China would rather talk, but it's ready to fight and is prepared to go the distance. So they I have an exact quote up. from that here. After 5,000 years of trials and tribulations, what kind of battle have the Chinese not been through? Right. And that evokes a whole history and historiography for the Chinese. But there's something else that China's doing, which I think has been under commented on. Obviously, that their primary goal is to get a deal if they can without paying too high a price. So their question has always been, as it always is in these negotiations, what's the least we have to do? Uh, their secondary goal is to appear strong to the Chinese people, to make it clear that, that they are defending China's interests. But there's, there's a third goal. If you listen to Xi Jinping and Liu He, the, the primary Chinese negotiator's language, they're talking a lot about China's sincerity, the need for free trade, for clear rules, to reform the WTO. And this language plays to the global community. It, their tertiary but important goal in mm -hmm. all of this, I think, is to convince the rest of the world that they are the more reasonable player than the United States. Is the rest of the world buying it? In a sense, that that's a broad generalization. I, are they so willing to deal when it comes to things like intellectual property? Well, Europe, for example, is not buying it in the first instance. They've been hearing this rhetoric from Xi Jinping since he gave his famous speech at Davos in 2016, just before President Trump was inaugurated, uh, that China was going to mm -hmm. lead an economic globalization. And there's been a lot of blowback because people have said you're not walking the walk, China's economy remains closed. And only uh, two or three weeks ago, the European Commission branded China as a systemic rival. Uh, in, that's very strong language for the European Commission, and it suggests that our allies are very much on our side if we wanted to bring them on our side. However, to date, there's no evidence of that. So while they have not yet bought 
entirely into the idea that China is going to be the defender of free trade or rules-based trade. They're still very worried that the United States is going to impose, for example, auto tariffs on European imports. Uh, they remain deeply resentful of the claim that steel and aluminum exports from Canada and the EU are national security threats to the United States. So China's been very consistent in its global public discourse to talk about rules and sincerity and to remain calm. And so there is this play for global hearts and minds. It's tertiary, but it's important. I, I remember your uh, uh, campaign season speaking tour through China where you discovered right. that audiences were, if not just entertained by uh, candidate Trump at the time, that actually really admired the candidate and his, his approach. Uh, how do they like him now? Well, you still have a range of views in China. Uh, there are reformers, including in, in highly positioned people, possibly even including Liu He, the chief negotiator, who have wanted to see China open up and to further reform its economy uh, for over a decade. These are mm -hmm. people who were particularly hopeful that Xi Jinping would follow his own blueprint for reform that was published in 2013, and that hasn't happened. Among economists and foreign policy intellectuals in China, you sometimes hear the claim that only Donald Trump can save China because he can force Xi Jinping to make the reforms they would like him to make. And this is one of the ironies of the whole trade negotiation and the broader competition between the United States and China. And we've mentioned this before. If our prescription for China to have a freer, more open economy and to be more closely integrated with a global rules-based order, if that prescription is the correct prescription for human flourishing, it enables China. It means that China surpasses the United States even more quickly. So we're a little bit confused as to what we're aiming for and what we should want. Do we want a resolution to this trade war or do we want the trade war to be the entryway into a more long-term competition between the United States that comprises security architectures, uh, rules making, norms. You, you feel tensions within the administration and within the United States as to where we would like to go. So if I'm understanding this, it, it, we could force reforms on China that would make them the juggernaut that they can become and are held back by because of some of the rules. that Absolutely. They we, we could actually be improving their economic oh, performance. Wouldn't that be a law of unintended consequences? <laughs> Along those lines, you know, if you listen to President Trump right now, he's, he's at least posturing as very confident about essentially bringing China to its knees. He's made some comments right. about if the Fed drops rates, we win easily. Uh, uh, how is, who's going to be in this for the long haul? Who can really wait well, the other this out? Is, Where do we start to feel the pinch? Right. Uh, and I think that that's the key question because there is no doubt, there's already ample evidence that uh, the trade war is hurting both sides. Our theory of the case from the beginning has been that because China exports more to the United States than we export to them, that therefore they will feel more pain. However, the Chinese economy appears to still be growing at a fairly healthy clip. The, most of the indicators in the first quarter are that China's economy has stabilized. It's probably at about 6.5% annual GDP growth, uh, so doing fairly well. Its dependence on exports has declined by about half over the past decade. Its exports to the United States are about 4% of its GDP. That's an important 4%, uh, 4 but they may be able to find substitute markets in some of those cases. And then you have in China, uh, and this was evoked by the nationalist TV announcer you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. there is a tradition of suffering for the country. Uh, China has been through a great many periods of patriotic privation they are practiced in taking this in a country where the state controls all of the media and all of the public discourse, uh, more or less. That is not true here. We are already wavering because of the pain that is being borne by the agricultural sector, which is enormous in some parts of the United States. I don't mean to belittle this, but I think that this is what uh, Senator Cotton, who, who you didn't quote by name, but who you quoted earlier as saying that the farmers haven't suffered the way American soldiers have. Right. Well, they never do. It's a rather strange way to put things, and it sounds almost like an accusation of a lack of patriotism on the part of the farmers. So I think it's not a very deft phrase, but he's also he's making an important point that if this is a long-term competition with our country of greatest strategic concern, China, then this isn't just going to be about soybeans. Uh, it's going to be about far more than that. However, the government, our government, has not yet put forward a plausible narrative to the American people 
about what's really why should at we stake. endure that, in, that yeah suffering. why should we endure that suffering and for the Chinese there's a readier narrative there than we have here. meanwhile the rest of the world is holding its breath because it won't just be suffering among the two countries there's a ripple effect on the no countries. and if this actually goes to the next phase which is the imposition of 25 percent tariffs on the remaining roughly 300 billion of Chinese imports to the United States that hasn't yet had tariffs slapped on it then you really could see a global economic slowdown mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, the highly interconnected supply chains, and that is deeply concerning for the whole world. In, in trying to figure out the various X factors and how they might factor into how this plays out, uh, how does the notion of, of, of a standoff between a president for life versus a president heading toward a, a very uphill climb re-election? Yes, this is absolutely a factor, um, and I think that this w could well prove to be the breaking point. Uh, president Trump's personal calculus of his own political interest uh, the stock market has been extremely volatile, even schizoid over the past year. It's been striking. We've seen this in the past 24 hours. Yeah. Any it, any sounding in the day while while recording, you know, you'll see this after today. But on the day we're recording, May 14th, yesterday was a 618 drop. Today, right. I checked right before we came into the studio. There was a rebound of more than half of that. And it but may we're not at the up, close yet. Bit, and we don't know what will happen by the close. Right. But the rebound is based in part on President Trump making positive statements that have no connection to any change in the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. It was merely an expression of confidence which moved the market. And over the past year, it's been true that whether President Trump or Beijing made a, pre a positive or a negative comment about the, the course of the trade war, you would see an immediate and exaggerated response from the market, which means that the market doesn't have an, a real understanding of the long-term competition between the United States and China, of which this is one facet. And we've talked about this before. U.S.-China relations continue to decline on all fronts. We haven't hit the low point yet. Uh, and we are already seeing a gradual, not government mandated, but market driven, a partial decoupling of the economies. That is going to remain in effect, even if there's a nominal trade deal. That doesn't seem to be understood or priced in by the market, which is still uh, hopeful or depressed based on minor, largely psychological crumbs from either government. You, you've, you've alluded to this in this response and, and earlier, essentially, keep your eyes on the forest, not just get lost in the trees. Right. And here's a, a, from CNN Business today. I think you'll relate to this. The United States and China don't just coexist. Their massive economies are deeply intertwined in ways that make the intensifying trade war unsustainable. This in an article predicting that this can't last a long time for that reason. That article predicts that this can't possibly last if this is an entirely rational and self-interested no, world. Rationality. Yes. Rash when you add, uh, to date, uh, it has not been an entirely rational uh, process. And again, we have seen partial decoupling. We have seen American and other third country manufacturers leaving China uh, for other countries that are not yet subject to these tariffs. We are going to have in July a new list of export controls published by the Department of Commerce, which are going to put uh, some technologies off limits to, uh, to China. We have already seen reform of CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which is going to limit uh, fair, to a tremendous extent Chinese direct foreign investment in the United States. We don't yet know how that plays out. There are new bills that are looking primarily in an academic context at which American technologies, which areas of R&D are too sensitive to permit nationals from China, but also Russia, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, from pr pursuing at, say, the postdoc level. This is all of a piece. And so we are probably going to see a continued decoupling of economies for security, national security, as well as economic reasons. And this is something, again, that the market hasn't quite understood. The CNN piece, I think, was a, a cry for rationality based on a merely economic relationship between the United States and China, but it's not Which could equal economic. wishful thinking. Right? Yep. So uh, uh, I, I should mention for those of you who are enjoying Robert's analysis, uh, he's been out there, uh, whether it's NPR or Washington Post or wherever it's been, lots of places, quoting you or interviewing you. So people who are interested in that, if you come to the Wilson Center mm. website and check out the Kissinger Institute page, you can find links to all kinds of of these encounters, which will be ongoing. So this isn't the finale, but it's one more question for at least today, which is look, uh, what, all your knowledge about uh, China's uh, uh, culture and history. 
uh, you made that point in the promotional video we did for the Wilson Center recently right. about the importance of understanding, in that particular instance, a piece of ancient poetry. Right. And given that, that knowledge base, uh, is this approach something that speaks to what will work with the China that you know? Well, the, the, the tariffs has, you know, got China's attention. And merely asking China to do what we thought of as the right thing didn't. And so it is good to have their attention. It's good to have this discussion uh, underway. But uh, we are not making an argument to the Chinese people. Uh, China, as I've mentioned, is speaking to the United States through negotiations, its primary objective. Mm -hmm. It's speaking very self-consciously to its own people against the background of not only its propaganda, but also a deeply felt history in China of the suffering that people have been through. And China is also speaking very self-consciously to the rest of the world with which China is integrated and which is very important. We seem to be having this conversation only with ourselves. And we are not uh, engaged in public diplomacy with the Chinese people to try to make our case there or to make it internationally. And I think that that is going to make it very hard for this approach of merely threats. Uh, to work to China. Uh, China has been threatened a great deal. It has undergone a great deal of privation. And frankly, I think that the Chinese people can be motivated uh, to suffer more for the, sense, for, for the sake of national greatness and frankly to combat what they're going to depict as American bullying. And that really resonates there. We need to make a public argument as well as, to the Chinese people as well as speak to the media and speak to Chinese negotiators behind closed doors. You mentioned bullying. There's a headline in a Chinese paper today, negotiate, we can fight, or we can fight, bring it on, bully us, you wish. So already speaking out against bullying. Well, we, we, we can't bully them, but we could convince a lot more of them if we were engaged in public diplomacy. A little bit, little bit of carrots mixed in with yeah. the six. Yeah. Robert, thank you, as always. Okay. Thanks you for joining us as well. I uh, hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and will join us again in the future. And for those of you who'd rather hear us than look at us, we're available <laughs> as an audio podcast as well. Thanks for joining us.